This is the Biblical Mind Podcast, produced by the Center for Hebraic Thought. Honest five-star reviews help others find this podcast. Visit the magazine at thebiblicalmind.org for articles and videos that explore the deep structures of scripture. I was on my Facebook yesterday and saw a quote by a friend of mine that he had put up. Restoration and reconciliation does not happen by staying away from people, but by uh, intensive forgiveness was kind of the idea. And I didn't didn't get a chance to explain to him why. So I strongly disagree with the simplicity, <laughs> the oversimplification. Uh, so I'll do that later today. Right. Um, but I think that's I think that's something we see a lot of times in the Christian world is we don't want to we don't want to feed into this quote unquote cancel culture and we don't want to mm. feed into a vindictive and an angry mindset. And so we swing to the other side of, Hey, the only way to reconcile, the only way to heal is forgive mm-hmm. as if forgiveness is both necessary and sufficient to reconciliation. Mm. How do you respond to the kind of uh, typical Christian ideal that you should just intensively forgive people, uh, you know, don't let them live rent free in your head or, you know, you, you just need to be the one who forgives, forgives, forgives. I think there's a lot of layers to that. Uh, my first response is that's not solid theology. That's not what we see in scripture. And it's very myopic. It's not that forgiveness is not important. It is. But what we understand that to be is often incorrect if you hold it up to uh, what scripture teaches forgiveness to be. Uh, And we often treat forgiveness as if it is both necessary and sufficient to restoration and reconciliation and healing. Uh, And it really is, it is necessary, but it is not sufficient for those things. Uh, And so when we present a very imbalanced view of what is necessary and sufficient for reconciliation and restoration and healing, what we've really done is put all of the burden on the victim And it's not really even in the victim's own self-interest. It's in the interest of keeping things comfortable for everybody else. And, and the other thing that that does is it, it sets forgiveness and justice at odds with one another, as if the idea Mm -hmm. of forgiveness um, means that we, we ignore what has happened, that we all just move on, that there's no um, restoration there's no reparations. It's just you have decided to move on. And I think that even when we look at how God forgives, um, it, it's not simply that he ignores what has happened. It's that he takes those consequences on himself. He fully plums the depths of what has happened. And on the other side of that, repentance, restoration, forgiveness. And so I think that I think that as communities, um, as Christian communities, we need to think through how are we working for justice in those ways that both recognize the depths of the evil around us and the goodness of God's forgiveness. Not setting those two things apart, but sitting with them both. And I think also it comes from a lot of imbalanced theology um, and a misunderstanding of scripture. You know, when you see, um, you know, to, to Jacob's point, um, you know, when, when God's forgiveness is accessed and needed out, it's accompanied by and predicated by repentance. Uh, and that, that restoration, that reunification with God, while it is complete and beautiful, it does not always, it is not always accompanied even in scripture by a removal of all of the consequences you know, David was repentant for raping Bathsheba, but he still lost his son. Now, I believe Adam and Eve accessed God's uh, forgiveness and grace, and yet they were still barred from the Garden of Eden. They were still under the curse. And oftentimes we treat forgiveness as if it means that uh, there there are no more healthy boundaries. We should not pursue consequences. Um, and, and like it means almost an erasure of what happened. And that's not what we see in scripture. Mm. And then we treat forgiveness also as if it is not, does not have to be accompanied by or predicated upon genuine repentance. Uh, And again, it creates this very imbalanced view that often dramatically harms survivors who have suffered. Um, But it also creates a very dangerous culture and community because what you're essentially doing when you do that is 
uh, communicating whatever has happened is not a big enough deal for us to instill consequences as long as you say the right words, uh, as long as the victim forgives. So it creates communities that foster and breed dangerous and abusive dynamics when we get this wrong. So I, I hear this, uh, a couple things going on in your answers, uh, one of which is thinking about um, the dynamics of comfort and status quo in, in Christian communities. We're t- speaking about uh, specifically here, uh, but also that when somebody does certain types of harms, that it becomes corrupting to the community itself in ways that can't be meted out by someone merely saying, uh, please forgive me. I forgive mm-hmm. you. I, I, I don't know if you've ever run into... Um, Ellie Wiesel's The Sunflower, you know, the issue of the the Nazi commander that grabs a Jewish man and, and says, forgive us for all of our you know sins against you because he's now realized and he wrestles with, well, can I forgive this? Can I forgive him on yeah. behalf of the thousands of people I saw massacred? And I, I do you have, you know, just early on here in this discussion, do you have like a, a safety rope you can throw us to, to help us think about how you guys have navigated that water and Uh, How much do you push back? Uh, Because obviously there would be a temptation just to begin lecturing people and say, look, uh, I don't think you understand what's happened here. Um, So how like just socially in the church have you navigated these waters? So I think one of the important foundations is to recognize that we're not talking about relinquishing biblical truth. We're talking about returning to biblical truth to a proper theological understanding of forgiveness, uh, to a proper understanding of God's justice, to how that is in his character and his work, uh, to how that's foundational to the gospel. So we're not talking about relinquishing biblical truth. We're talking about returning to it. Um, yeah, And those discussions are difficult in the church. Um, I think you need to, as much as possible, assume goodwill and enter into those discussions in good faith, uh, looking to Um, to glorify God in that process. But I also do think it's important to say that um, sometimes the pursuit of justice requires standing up and saying, you are getting this wrong and you are hurting people because you are getting this wrong. Uh, And that doesn't have to be done out of ungodly anger or vengeance or vindictiveness. It's done out of a love for the truth, Mm -hmm. uh, out of a love for God and out of a love for those who are made in his image, who are being wounded when we get this wrong. And I think that there's really, there's, there's two Mm. parts to that question. There's the theoretical, which is the much easier part to live in. Um, You know, pretty much everyone agrees that having an attitude of, of forgiveness and reconciliation, um, you know, is, is, is better for everybody. Um, But like you said, when you get to something as horrific as the Holocaust, um, how do, is, is there any possible way that that as humans we can wrap our minds around that level of evil and do justice before we can get to reconciliation? And I think for for us, one of the things that kind of grounds that discussion uh, is is realizing that ultimately um, true justice and true uh, or ultimate forgiveness and ultimate reconciliation uh, happens in God, uh, that that God is going to restore all things. He is going to make all things right. He is going to um, perfectly adjudicate justice. Um, so just starting from that foundation of realizing we don't have to get everything. We're not the final arbiters of everything. We are within a limited scope of what we can um, influence in our daily lives and in our, our scope of influence. So realizing that, you know, we're, we're not going to come to perfect conclusions and perfect answers because this, this discussion really gets to the biggest questions of the, of practical theology. You know, why does evil exist? What do we do about it? Um, so there's ha- having that confidence first that, that God is, um, concerned with justice gives us the um, foundation to then be pursuing justice and forgiveness in our, in our own way. 
Uh, and I think it really requires properly defining those terms because those terms have been so incorrectly defined in Christendom that understandably, often when you use those terms, the immediate response of the survivor is is fear, uh, is grief, is suffering, because those terms are wielded against them uh, in ways that are very unbiblical and ungodly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, if you look at a proper definition of forgiveness, you see it is a very, it, it's it's individual to me. It is my choice to release my desire mm-hmm. for vengeance because I can rest in God's perfect justice. Um, and so, you know, to, to answer that question of, can I forgive on behalf of everyone? No, I can't. That's not, that's not my role. That's not my place. It's individual to me. Um, and to be clear about that. So, um, so you are not taking away agency and voice from those who have been harmed by speaking on their behalf. That's very important. And it requires defining forgiveness properly, uh, defining restoration and reconciliation properly. Oftentimes when the church uses those terms, what they really mean is everybody is just like they were before. And all the relationships mm-hmm. are just like they were before. And that's often not possible when deep trauma has happened. It's often usually not safe when you are dealing with someone, especially who's an abuser, because they're very skilled manipulators. Uh, and so when we're talking about restoration mm-hmm. and reconciliation, what we are not saying is when you reach this beautiful thing called reconciliation, everybody is the way they were before. And all the relationships are the way they were before. Uh, and now we're moving forward as a community as if this never happened. That is not a proper understanding of reconciliation and restoration, but that's often how we use it. And when we use those terms incorrectly, we lose the ability to discuss what they really are and to move towards them in a way that is healthy and holds that tension uh, of justice as the foundation for those things. I, I've i heard it in your own story, uh, Rachel, this this battling back and forth with, uh, should I report this? Will I be believed? Should I report this? Will I be believed? And you're speaking now about the, how you treat the the survivor and this tension with, um, the status quo and specifically speaking about the church, but this could be true in any community. It, it sounds like to me that, um, assuming there are sometimes some types of egregious violations going on within any human community and then using those as a, a litmus test for, what the true concerns of the community are. Cause everything you're saying, I'm thinking to myself, well, what else would you do? What, like, why would you want it to go back to normal? Why, like what, there's gotta be something else hanging out there that people are looking at that they're saying, well, this is better than having to deal with this other thing over here. Mm-hmm. So what, what would be, I'm, you don't have to throw anybody under the bus here, but what would be your like general diagnosis of what is the thing that people are gazing at rather than actually facing the realities of what's happening in their community? I think that's very multi-layered. Um, at the outset, I do think a significant portion of it is exactly what Jacob said earlier. It's comfort. It would cost to care. Now, oftentimes we don't cognitively realize necessarily that that's what we're doing. Uh, oftentimes there's a level of chosen ignorance. It's not like this hasn't been said before, um, but there is a level of chosen ignorance. Um, If you are going to pursue justice and you're going to acknowledge the depth of the damage that's been done in your community, it means you're going to have to say and do some very hard things, probably in relation to your own community members. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, there is something we care about more. Mm -hmm. That might be a theological goal, maybe even a good theological goal. It might be a political goal, uh, a professional goal. Um, it might just be the fact that we really don't like hard conversations. Uh, there are rela- There's a relational mm-hmm. cost to hard conversations. There's something that matters more to us. Uh, but what that really reveals is that we also don't understand the depth of evil. Because if a relationship can mean more to you than the truth and more to you than the damage that was done to an individual, you have not wrestled with the depth of evil. Uh, I think in evangelical communities, as it relates to sexual abuse specifically, we have some very imbalanced theology on male and female sexuality uh, that leads us to really minimize the damage of sexual abuse uh, and to not see it as nearly a significant enough problem. Um, We have an imbalance in our counseling methodologies and ideologies, so we don't understand the impact of trauma um, and just the cascading neurological and physical realities that causes. Uh, but in evangelical communities, by and large, it really does uh, distill down to improper theology, whether that's an improper theology of sexuality, of forgiveness, uh, of our counseling methodologies. Our ideas drive our actions. And at some point in time, we have to stop just talking about the actions and we have to look at the ideas that are driving them. And again, that costs. Mm-hmm. 
And, and I think another um, general idea too, mm-hmm. is that institutions and organizations that are oriented to helping the weak that are oriented to doing justice for the oppressed uh, for the people who aren't in positions of power, um, those institutions necessarily are structured in a way that that comes at a cost of authority, prestige, and power for those who are at the top. Mm. And often we find that one of the reasons, it's not because one of the reasons people and organizations struggle to um, respond well and to pursue justice in these ways is not because, you know, they're sitting there consciously thinking we like abuse. We like rape. We are going to do what we can to engender these things. It's that it's that in order to um, properly address those things, they would have to give something up. They would have to give up a level of autonomy, of authority, of money, of uh, respect, and and it's very easy in those instances to um, come up with reasons why your situation is different. You know, it's if you go anytime a you know story comes out, you know everyone on Twitter or and social media is will line up on ideological grounds. You know, if it's a if it's a Republican, well then you know the Democrats are quick to point it out. If it's if it's the other way around, people have a tendency to defend. Um, and that's just human nature. Um, I, I think anyone who's trying to make it sound like, oh, that's just one, that's an evangelical problem or that's a, well, it's, mm-hmm. it's a human nature problem. And I think, but I think that as Christians, we, we have a um, mandate to identify that tendency and to kill it. Uh, that we need, that we need to self-consciously be orienting our institutions and our churches uh, so that we are focused not on the rich man who comes in, but uh, giving honor where honor is due to all men. No, and I know we, you know, everybody likes to think that they do this. And, and I really think this is at the crux of okay. a lot of it too, um, is in order to really wrestle with, is my theology accurate? Have I consistently applied my theology? Am I learning from those who know more than me uh, in these areas? Am I learning from those who have suffered? In order to do those things, you have to have a very deep spirit of humility. You have to be willing to grapple with your own sinfulness and your own blindness and your own complicity in what has taken place in your community. You know, all of us emotionally think we do the right things because it feels so much better to think that. Um, so, you know, you start talking about authority and you say, oh, well, authority was given to be servant hearted. Pastors need to be servant hearted. Every pastor out there, including all of all of the big name ones. Well, of course, that's what I do. I am servant hearted. That is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about authority. But you look at how they actually apply the authority and the, the extreme deference above and beyond what we would give to somebody who is not in that prominent position of authority. Uh, that's not actually how they're applying authority. That's not how they're talking about, say, the importance of independent investigations. Their concern is not in actuality with an independent investigation bringing out everything it needs to bring out. Their concern is, are you asking for an investigation in a way that undermines authority? And so you can see by the way they teach and they talk about it and they practically apply concepts of authority. It's not actually servant hearted. It's not humble, but they intensely believe that it is. Um, And I think that really, you know, our, our sinful hearts are always the biggest impediment to doing the right thing. And you certainly see that here in order to wrestle with these realities, you would have to be willing to see your own error and your own complicity and the damage that you've done and to own that very publicly. And the more public you are uh, and the more public your platform is, the more public your repentance has to be. Um, And oftentimes this is accompanied by a very fear-based response. Uh, So, you know, if, if I acknowledge that uh, perhaps our theology has been imbalanced or it's been applied in ways that are damaging. Uh, well, then th- that the gospel of Christ is going to be damaged or the church is going to be torn down. Mm-hmm. This is a liberal plot to take down evangelicals. It's a very fear-based response. Um, and what it really demonstrates is a lack of trust in God's sovereignty. God has managed to preserve his church uh, since the dawn of time for thousands of years. 
and he will manage to continue preserving his church. Your job is not to protect the job, your, the church. Your job is to do what's right. That's to tell the truth, to pursue justice, uh, to have a public repentance where necessary. Your job is not to protect the church, but we act like it is. And when we have that fear-based response, what we're demonstrating is that we don't really believe our theology about God's sovereignty and power. Would you say, obviously, you've been out in public, been a very prominent voice, uh, so I assume that people have been emailing you, calling you. I assume that you've probably gotten some very nasty messages along with some encouraging ones and along with other survivors who are telling you their story. Uh, From your perspective into the church, um, do you think it would be safe to assume if I was a pastor of a church that there is some kind of sexual abuse going on right now in the church? There is some kind of spousal abuse. There is some kind of a person wielding power over somebody vulnerable and that I should begin orienting the leadership of the church and our preaching, our teaching to kind of help uh, uncover those things? Or is that too aggressive? No, that is absolutely accurate. Now, that doesn't mean that there is a pastor or a leadership figure in your church abusing, but is there abuse taking place in your church, domestic and sexual abuse? 100%. Yes, it's happening. It's happening right there in your congregation under your nose. Um, And because abusers are very skilled manipulators, you are very unlikely to see it unless you're trained to see it. In fact, if a woman comes to you and she begins disclosing concerns about her marriage, you are more likely statistically significantly more likely to actually empower the abuser and keep her in an abusive and dangerous situation. That's the norm for mm. evangelical churches. And I wish I, I wish I didn't have to say that, but that's the norm. In addition to that, you should be assuming that 25% of the women in your congregation have suffered sexual violence because we know those are the statistics. A third of them have suffered or are suffering domestic violence. Uh, and at least one in six men in your congregation have suffered sexual violence. You should be aware that out of every crime committed on a human who survives, it has the farthest reaching impacts for their mental health, their spiritual health, higher rates of PTSD symptoms and substance abuse and depression and anxiety. It has incredibly long reaching effects, but survivors are very good at doing something we call flipping the switch which means that they appear as normal as possible for as long as possible because it's so much safer than trusting someone with those secrets than letting them in. So unless you have signaled that you are a safe place, that you understand trauma, that you understand abuse and abusive dynamics, you have essentially guaranteed that you're never going to hear about it. I I have heard from so many pastors who will start wrestling with this issue and they will be like, I, I mentioned in a sermon this week, you know, mm-hmm. that, Hey, if you've been abused, we're a safe place. We want to help you, et cetera, et cetera. And they say, it's like a floodgate opens people that have been in the church for 10, 20 years had no idea would be like, this is a dominating factor in my life. I have been struggling with, you know, I was raped as a child. I was abused as a child. My dad beat me all this sort of stuff and it's not until they 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 signal that that they um start to hear so even just from a a pastoral ministry standpoint if you are if you are wanting to you know shepherd god's sheep as best as you can this is something you need to know that you know a significant portion of your sheep are struggling with um so it's a just signaling that, uh, and in, in evangelical churches, I think about how often we talk about, um, submission, especially for women. Um, if, if that was, if that was balanced with just as many exhortations about abuse of power, uh, I would really like to see that. Uh, And this also means that you have to be a, we need to have a level of intentionality. Um, yeah, if you had 25% of your congregation who, uh, had lost a spouse 
or 25% of your congregation who had just had babies or who were fighting cancer or unemployment, chances are you'd have some level of intentional ministry. You might have a grief support group. You might have meal trains. You would be ministering to these people with intentionality. But we have those same statistics for sexual and domestic violence, and we have nowhere near the level of intentionality. Uh, Nobody has the knowledge base to know how to open those doors of communication and what to do when that floodgate opens or they receive a disclosure. Um, And the vast majority of what pastors often do in the shepherding context is counseling. And yet we are woefully underprepared to counsel trauma survivors and to counsel unhealthy marriages. Uh, And so when we don't counsel in ways that understand abuse and abusive dynamics, again, what you do is you further damage the victim themselves. And if they're currently in an unhealthy marriage, you are almost always guaranteed to further keeping them in that abusive marriage to actually empower the damage to keep being done. So we have to have a level of intentionality with understanding these dynamics, educating yourself, uh, and then ministering in ways that are intentional and practical. This also means you need to be intensely aware uh, of the dynamics that you may not be thinking of as, as related to abuse, but that you might be preaching on. Um, so, you know, looking, looking back at my history in the evangelical churches, I was by and large in very healthy churches, especially growing up. But I look back at the messages that I absorbed and what I didn't hear. And there are so many significant Mm -hmm. gaps that my soul was just crying out for. You know, I heard so many sermons on the importance of recognizing my own sin, which I needed to hear. What I didn't hear any of was God's heart for the sin done against me. I heard so many sermons on forgiveness, Mm -hmm. none on the biblical pursuit of justice, none. Um, You know, oftentimes when we preach on marriage, you're going through the epistles and you're talking about marriage, how marriage is talked about, how divorce is talked about, sends the message uh, that women are not safe uh, to speak up in abusive marriages. Um, So we have to be aware of how we're teaching and preaching on all of these other issues that are very much enmeshed with concepts and dynamics of abuse, but that we might not think of as being enmeshed unless we're being intentional about understanding those dynamics. Uh, with with respect to to justice, um, thinking back on how I've heard it discussed, in practicality, it's God's justice is discussed when it's in relation to my sin. Um, you know, which of course, again, extremely important. If we're not recognizing our own complicity and sinfulness, then you know we can't be actually siding with God in the pursuit of of justice. But further than that. Um, so that was the one context. And then the other context is that justice is kind of assumed as criminal justice, and that's the job of the government. And there was, there was no idea of re- the, the work of reconciliation, of reparation, any of these as, as something to do with the church, that the church has an obligation to pursue justice um, because that's who God is. It, justice was is merely conceived of as the punishment of sin, um, and I think mm-hmm. you know there's a there in some circles there's a push against penal substitutionary atonement. I personally think that the idea of punishment is very important, but if we stop there, it extremely imbalanced, mm-hmm. and oftentimes you, it, it, that idea of of you know sin must be punished. It's often just wielded against the, I was reflecting on this. It's often just wielded against you know, the vulnerable. Um, you know, you, you think just kind of the, the trope in um, the American justice system of, you know, the black man who is, um, you know, found with an ounce of marijuana, you know, spending an inordinate amount of, of time in jail, whereas the, you know, the, the privileged uh, lawyer easily gets off. And there's not and, and we say, well, everyone deserves a second chance. Well, it seems that those second chances seem to gravitate to a certain socioeconomic uh, group and the hard justice, you know, justice must be done and uh, seems to be more applied to uh, other groups. And so um, with this there needs to be alongside this idea of, of, you know, justice being done uh, in terms of, of punishment. The church can't just abdicate the idea of justice to the government. 
I think that's been absolutely disastrous. Now, obviously, you know, especially as a, a Baptist, I don't want churches wielding the sword um, in terms of punishment. But there, there's a whole, there's a whole scope of justice work that needs to be done that needs to be talked about and i really think that we just have kind of glossed over that um because we like to focus on certain aspects of it and i think that there's a huge um there's a huge area of discussion just waiting to happen and and in evangelical circles there's kind of a resistance to expanding the talk of justice because that's seen as a quote unquote liberal or, or woke agenda. And, and I think, well, let's look at scripture. Scripture's idea of justice is so much more than what the magistrate is doing. And we like this in other contexts, generally speaking. It was really interesting to me, um, you know, that the sentencing hearing for Larry was literally broadcast around the world. And the vast majority of people were extremely positive towards all survivors having the right to speak uh, and their parents and their coaches having the right to speak. Now, we did get some pushback in the legal community going, look, this goes way beyond what our system was designed to do. I disagree with that. I think we have a very myopic view of justice. And part of justice is the restoration insofar as it is possible uh, of what was taken. Uh, And so to restore agency, to restore voice to the survivors, I think it was absolutely appropriate to do uh, in the justice system. But by and large, uh, everybody loved that. Everybody loved that the prosecutor and the judge agreed to let all survivors speak. Uh, And we talked about what a good thing that was and how that was part of our justice system. Um, But we're not asking that question when it comes to churches. Uh, How do we restore agency to those who have been harmed? How do we elevate the voices of those who have been harmed. Uh, What do we need to do uh, to begin restoring? Oftentimes when we talk about restoration and reconciliation, what we really mean is let's make the community feel better so we don't have to think about this anymore. But restoration and reconciliation really is oriented towards the one who has been harmed. How do we restore what was taken? How do we reconcile the gulf that this sin created Uh, by bringing the person who is harmed back into our community, back into loving care and loving fellowship. Uh, Even reconciliation and restoration is is oriented towards the one who was harmed. But when we talk about it in our churches and our Christian communities, we're not actually thinking about the victim at all. We just mean, how do we make the community feel better? If I could conglomerate a lot of things that you're saying here, what I'm hearing, and you tell me if this is accurate, is that when somebody who has uh, suffered in some way, significant way, an injustice, comes to a pastor or leader in the church, that that's actually a very precious moment that needs to be handled carefully because they've probably overcome several personal, psychological, social hurdles uh, mm-hmm. to come to that moment. And what you, how you respond, like so a proper response might focus uh, instead on, oh, are we opening an inquiry, more like an injustice has been done uh, and and uh, this grieves God's heart, and mm-hmm. we need to make sure that uh, justice is done here. And that doesn't merely mean punishing somebody. That means mm-hmm. several things that need to happen from this point Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Um, and it also, also sounds like um, I got some good training in seminary as a pastor, including my pastoral theology professor saying, if you invite me into your church, I'm going to speak on spousal abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then you're going to see how many spouses are abused in your church. Cause they're going to say, you never preached on it. That was his threat to make us be, uh, preach on spousal abuse, That's which amazing. is brilliant. Um, yeah, uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was not a veiled threat. Apparently he does this, uh, for real, <laughs> uh, to shame, shame people into preaching on it. Um, but, uh, so we, we might want to list in on the, the webpage corresponding to this podcast, um, some resources that pastors might run to, uh, to think about these moments where people are revealing these things to them. What do they do? Cause I know a lot of people like me as a young pastor would have felt overwhelmed and completely uh, incompetent in these moments. Um, I do want to talk about also the part of the story is, uh, of Larry Nasser is, the complicity of organizations. And I think that the Torah and Jesus are both excoriating and excavating this, not just that individuals sin, not just that individuals commit evils against other individuals, but that actually it gets bound up in s- systems um, of 
of corruption. Um, I think you even see it in Sodom and Gomorrah. The opening to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is every man from the town, every last man, all the men, like this exhaustive description of complicity. So is it possible, and well, maybe I can just be very direct. Rachel and Jacob, have you, can you forgive an organization that has been complicit in some really dodgy ways, actually more than dodgy? Um, or is that the wrong thing to say? Like, oh, you need to forgive the organization. Uh, and I'm sure people have said, uh, or at least intimated that, Rachel, you need to forgive Larry, and that's the only way you'll be set free from this, and, and, that, and then you can move on. Um, what do you do with that, those sentiments when they're lobbed at you? Uh, so forgiveness is something I offered to Larry in my victim impact statement. Um, and, and I say offered because theologically, uh, I believe he hasn't accessed it. It's available to him, but he hasn't repented. Um, in terms of forgiving organizations, you know, it's individuals who do the action. Uh, and so I think our forgiveness is oriented towards individuals. Um, so for me, that looks like Kathy Clagus, the gymnastics coach in 1997, who received two direct reports of Larry's abuse and didn't do anything. So three years later, I walked in his door. Uh, you know, that means the dean of the medical college, uh, who was himself a sexual predator who mocked my video testimony uh, and made fun of me when I came forward. Uh, it means individuals in those organizations. You know, the head of USAG that uh, not only had this system of burying reports of sexually abusive coaches and creating this environment where abuse could flourish, uh, but who actually asked for help uh, killing the story where I came forward uh, and making sure that, that things stayed as quiet as possible. Um, I think my forgiveness is oriented towards individuals because it's individuals who do the action. Uh, and so on a theological level, uh, it, it really is the same. It's, it's recognizing um, that it is releasing my personal desire for vengeance to get back at them because I rest in God's perfect justice. Uh, and that, that offering that forgiveness does not minimize, it does not mitigate, it does not excuse, uh, it doesn't make me like I was before. But it does free me to trust in God's justice. And I think that the relationship between forgiveness and repentance is often kind of glossed over. But repentance makes forgiveness possible uh, because if if I you know and and of course I'm I'm not speaking of people who are speaking colloquially and you know I I forgive them meaning that they've released their anger and their bitterness. But I think that at least in scripture, forgiveness actually results in a change in the relationship. If, mm -hmm. if someone is, is living in um, a way that is harmful to themselves and harmful to others, we don't want, we for their own good and for the good of society, we can't forgive that. I mean, if we say, well, let's forgive Larry Nasser, okay, we would set him free. I mean, because the man is not repentant, he hasn't changed. That would be that would be a great evil to do that. So when we say that you know have an attitude of forgiveness to him, what that means is we want him to change. We want him to recognize the great evil that he's done and to change. Now, practically speaking, would we ever see that with someone like Larry Nasser? I don't know. That's but hypothetically speaking, an attitude of forgiveness to him is that we don't want him to suffer the consequences uh, of his own sinfulness. I would say we don't. I'm going to clarify that. We don't want him to suffer the eternal separation yes. from God. Forgiving Larry, even were he to be fully repentant, the consequences here on earth of what he has done must and should yeah. still remain. Yeah. So exactly. Um, so this idea of, you know, repentance um, repentance and forgiveness have to go hand in hand. So what, what an attitude of forgiveness uh, does not mean you don't pursue justice. An attitude of forgiveness means that what you are, what you are um, wanting is that ultimate restoration, that ultimate um, making of all things new, that you're, 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 you're siding with God uh, and God's heart in these things. But it's not this. It's not this idea that well, we just let bygones be bygones. Well, Jacob and Rachel Den Hollander, thank you so much for your wisdom, for your time, and for your leadership, being out there in front, uh, speaking to the church on this topic. Well, thank you so much for having us. You've been listening to the Biblical Mind Podcast. 
exploring the deep structures of Christian scripture. For more, visit the magazine at thebiblicalmind.org. Subscribe to this podcast at all the usual places so you never miss an episode. 